There we are. I hope we can all see that. Uh, so thank you for joining us tonight. We are continuing our studies in the letter to the Colossians uh, from chapter three into chapter four. And we're going to think of the subject of relationships. Just before we do that, let's just bow in prayer and seek God's help and blessing uh, in the meeting this evening. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks that we can turn to the scriptures, the word of God. We have it in our own language. We have it in our own tongue. We can read it. We can understand it. We give thanks for the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. We pray that this evening as we uh, contemplate and consider these verses that we may uh, realize and understand their meaning and be able to apply them to our lives in a way that will be for the glory of the Lord Jesus. We seek thy blessing tonight and we give thanks for all who've logged in and we pray for thy help in the Lord's name. Amen. Now, as I say, we're continuing the practical section of the letter to the Colossians. We've noticed that Paul begins by uh, opening up some theology, some doctrine, and then he applies that doctrine, as we're going to see tonight, to our everyday living. Uh, there is no such thing as theoretical Christianity. It is very practical. We did mention, I think the last time we had this, that it would be perhaps man's way of doing things to collect all the doctrines of the Bible in one portion of the book. So if we'd been writing the Bible, perhaps we'd have had a, a section of theology, one of all the doctrines together. But that's not, that's not how God revealed his truth. He interweaves the revelation of doctrine with practical exhortation, because Christianity is nothing if it's not practiced. And we can have the knowledge in our heads, we can have the theory and the abstract but we need to work it out in our lives. And so that's what we're doing as we look at this section. We continue in the practical section of uh, Colossians, and we're thinking uh, specifically about uh, relationships. So let's just um, continue, and we're going to read from chapter 3, verse 15, down to verse 6 of chapter 4. So let's read this together. Chapter 3, verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that, hath, that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which you have done, and there is no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven." Continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be alway with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. Now we're going to think in this section of different relationships. We're going to find that Christianity can't be compartmentalized and just say, well, that's my spiritual life. If we are a Christian, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus, we've experienced the new life, we've been united to him as we've been learning in Colossians. He is the head. We are members of the body and we are brought into different relationships and it is in these relationships that we express the reality of Christianity. And in this section, there are three parts. First of all, 
he talks about Christian relationships, verse 15 to 17. And he's going to talk about three comprehensive principles for Christian relationships. He talks about the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. And this is the relationship between Christians. And these are three great principles that govern our behavior in Christian relationships. And then we're going to think about human relationships from uh, verse 18 down to chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, Paul is focusing not now on our relationship with other Christians, but more human, natural relationships. And so he talks about three specific human relationships, wives and husbands, children and parents, servants and masters. And so we see that uh, it's, it's widening out to every department of our lives. And then finally, in the last section, we could say that Paul is really thinking about world relationships. In other words, how do we react and relate to people around us? And there are three areas of Christian witness which Paul mentions. He mentions prayer, specifically for himself, but really for the spread of the gospel. And then he mentions the walk of the believer, the conduct of the Christian uh, towards those who are without, those who are outside of Christ. And he mentions finally our speech, that it should be always gracious, but seasoned with salt. Now, there's a lot to cover. We're not going to go into great detail on all these things, but it just shows us, just looking over the, the scope of this passage, how that Christianity uh, affects and affects every department of our lives. Let's think, first of all, of Christian relationships. And the first principle he identifies is the peace of Christ. You'll notice that it says in chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of God. Most versions of the Bible, and perhaps more accurately uh, render this, the peace of Christ rather than the peace of God. And so let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be thankful. Here's the first great principle as we think of our relationship with other Christians. It's called the peace of Christ. Now notice this, please. This idea of ruling in your hearts. It's a very unusual word. I think it's only used here in the Bible, and it means to act as an umpire, to arbitrate, to decide, to preside, almost to have the casting vote. And uh, I've heard it applied in many ways, of course, this verse, that uh, when we come in our lives to decisions that we have to make, and perhaps there's no clear guidance from Scripture, there's no chapter or verse we can go to, then sometimes the guidance is given through the enjoyment of the peace of Christ. Do I have the peace of Christ in my heart about this kind of decision? Now, I'm quite sure that that is possibly true, but it's not really the context that Paul is talking about here, because he goes on to say that we are called to this in one body. So he's talking about peace that is to be enjoyed and expressed in a corporate way, not in an individual way. It's quite true that I need to have the peace of Christ in my heart, and I need to have it ruling and presiding, but it is in view of my relationship with other Christians. And so, just very simply, I think Paul is saying is that in our Christian lives, there are times in the local assembly, for example, when there are decisions to be made, there are things to be done, and we can't turn to the Bible for, a, for a, a definite verse about this, and it's not clearly stated in the Scripture how we should act. But here is a guiding principle uh, in relation to our interaction with believers in the local church, in the local expression of the body of Christ. And it is this, that we allow the peace of Christ to arbitrate, to decide. And so it makes us careful in our actions that nothing that we do disturbs the enjoyment of the peace of Christ in my heart and also in the local assembly. And so I think that if you have people meeting together, fellowshipping together, and they're guided by this rule, this arbiter, that is the, the enjoyment of the peace of Christ in my heart, I can't do anything that would disturb that peace, that would lessen my enjoyment of it. And so I allow this principle to guide me in situations uh, where perhaps there's no clear scripture or definite guidance from the Word of God. The principles are there, of course. And, of course, thankfulness is the result, he says, and be thankful. We're going to discover as we go through this passage briefly that thankfulness is emphasized so often. And I believe this with all my heart, that if you have Christians who are thankful, then that's a very healthy 
uh, local assembly. If you have a group of believers who are so grateful and thankful and have that spirit, it's when we get murmuring and get complaining and get dissatisfied that the problems start to multiply and suddenly we have difficulties in the local assembly. Let us maintain this spirit of enjoying in our hearts the peace of Christ, the peace that the Lord Jesus gives us, the peace that he's brought us into, the enjoyment of that, and let us, as we consider each other in the local assembly, let us consider each other and not do anything and not act in any way that would disturb our enjoyment of the peace of Christ. That's the first great rule. The second rule is the word of Christ, because he goes on to say, in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, this idea of the word of Christ, some suggest it's the word about Christ. Some suggest it's actually the words of Christ, the words that Christ spoke. I think this is simply uh, another expression that uh, refers to the word of God. It's the word of Christ because he is the theme of scripture. And so Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Literally, this means, uh, this literally means be at home in you. In, in other words, um, the, the word of God is not to be a visitor in my life. Rather, it is to be a resident. You know the difference. A visitor is someone who just pays an occasional visit. It doesn't last too long, hopefully, and uh, soon they're on their way again. And sadly, some of us treat the Word of God like that, and we pull it down at times, and we read a bit here and a bit there. But the Word of God, the Word of Christ, should be at home in our hearts, in our lives. And brothers and sisters, there is, there is nothing simpler and nothing more important, perhaps, in our Christian lives than giving attention to the Word of God and allowing the Word of God to be at home in our hearts. And so uh, somebody expressed it like this, that we're so immersed in the Scripture, we're so enjoying the Scripture, the Word of God becomes part of us, and we, we begin to think in Scripture. We begin to, the un, unknown to ourselves even perhaps, the, the, the principles of Scripture, the tone of Scripture seems to affect our very thinking. And uh, it's wonderful when that happens. And you find believers who are acting in a spiritual way, not because they're making a conscious decision to do it, but because they've been so toned, as it were, by the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. And there are a number of effects that will result from that. First of all, enrichment. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, the idea is extravagantly. In other words, don't be... Uh, don't, don't accept the Word of God into just a small part of your life, or don't just enjoy a little bit of it. In other words, let it abound. That's the idea of the word richly. But it also may have the idea that in its enriching power. In other words, as we give ourselves to the Word of Christ, as we meditate on the Word of God, as we read it day by day, as we ask uh, the Lord to guide us into the truth of Scripture, perhaps we read and we read and we perhaps don't understand all that we're reading, but brothers and sisters, that is the best time to keep on reading, keep on reading. And as we do this, we find this enriches our spiritual lives. And remember, this is in the context of Christian relationships with each other. You can always tell Christians who are enjoying the scriptures. You can always tell Christians who are enjoying the word of Christ, because it comes out, listen to this, in encouragement. He says, teaching and admonishing one another. You can put a full stop there. It's not to do with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's teaching and admonishing one another. In other words, if I'm filling my heart and my life with the word of God and allowing it to dwell in me richly, then I'm able to help other people. I'm, I'm able to teach other people. I don't mean from the pulpit, from the platform. It may be that I'm able just to drop a word. I'm able to just give some guidance to help people. And as I do that, and, and perhaps even admonishing and, and helping to uh, a saint, a believer, to travel in the right way. I'm doing that because I am enriched by the Word of God. And as we come together, brothers and sisters, as we come together as a local church, because this is all corporate, as we come together as a local church, uh, it is expected that we have been feeding on the Word of God. And as we feed on the Word of God, we're able to help each other. And we're able to encourage each other. 
And we'll find that if we're not feeding, if the first time in the week we pick up our Bibles is to go out to the midweek Bible study, well, we'll have very little to contribute. We'll have very little to give to the spiritual upbuilding of the Lord's people, teaching and admonishing one another. But then it leads to enjoyment as well, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so here is the expression. You see, what happens is this, that that because we're, we're steeped in the Word of God and enjoying the truths of the Word of God, it finds its expression. And we're so grateful in the English language for the, the, the rich treasury of hymns that we have and spiritual songs and the Psalms, of course. And we can use these to express and to sing intelligently. Do you like hymns just because of the nice tune? <laughs> well, the tune helps a lot, doesn't it? But brothers and sisters, the whole point of Christian hymns and songs is that they convey and they rejoice and they are enjoying a truth. And that truth is found in the Word of God. And I'll tell you this, if you begin to read your Bible more seriously, more frequently, and more carefully, you'll enjoy your hymns a lot more. <laughs> you'll enjoy singing a lot more because these hymns are expressing truths that are so uh, uh, clear in the Word of God. Let me just say something about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, because, um, of course, there are some of our dear brothers and sisters who feel that we should just sing the psalms. Um, there are some Christians who never sing the psalms. We can go to different extremes on this. But I think that uh, here is a clear indication that the Christians in New Testament times, they certainly used the psalms uh, from the Old Testament. But they also sang hymns. Now, hymns uh, seem to be ascriptions of praise addressed to God. And so uh, there are hymns, uh, perhaps doxologies in the New Testament that perhaps formed early hymns. There are passages of the New Testament. The scholars tell us that the, the, the Greek is arranged in such a way that this is, this is a piece of uh, almost poetry. It's, it's, it's a song, perhaps. It's a hymn. And so perhaps the Psalms refer to the Old Testament Psalms. The hymns are ascriptions of praise to God, addressed to God. And spiritual songs are songs of testimony, songs about our spiritual experience, songs that encourage each other. And so if you go through your hymn book, you can perhaps, uh, if it's a decent hymn book, you can mark the ones that are Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Just put a P, H, and an S beside them and a pencil. And that will keep you right. But Paul says the important thing is that as we are together in the local church, we cannot neglect the word of Christ in our individual lives. If we do so, then our gatherings together will not be enriching. Uh, they will be dull. They will not be, uh, they will not be, uh, we will be getting no spiritual food. And so this is the important thing. First of all, the peace of Christ. Secondly, the word of Christ. And let me just, before we go on from this passage, point out uh, something you perhaps know, that this is almost, it's not quite word for word, but it's a very similar parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5. And you'll notice that in Colossians, it's let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In Ephesians chapter 5, it's be filled with the Spirit, but the outcome is the same. So if you read Colossians teaching and admonishing one another, uh, if you read uh, Ephesians is speaking to yourselves. It doesn't mean talking to yourself. It means communicating with other believers, just as we have it in Colossians. And then in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You can see how similar they are. Now, that's a very important parallel because it tells us that being filled with the Spirit is practically the same as allowing the Word of Christ to be at home in your heart. You see, brothers and sisters, we have this idea sometimes that being filled with the Spirit is some sort of mystical, out-of-body experience, when all the time the Holy Spirit is seeking to use the Word of God. It's by uh, submitting to the Word of God, by reading the Word of God, by yielding to the Word of God, that I yield to the control of the Holy Spirit. And so whether you call it letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, or whether you call it being filled with the Spirit, the outcome in practical terms is exactly the same. Now, the third uh, principle, we'll have to move on quickly here, the name of Christ. So Paul says, finally, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus really means 
on his behalf, in his stead, in a way that is consistent with his character. We can understand this quite readily. If I do something in the name of somebody else, it means I'm acting on their behalf. They're not present. So I maybe have to go to the local authority, the council offices for something, and someone asks me to do it on their behalf. And so I say, well, I'm doing this in the name of so-and-so. Um, I'm representing them. And so if I'm acting on behalf of somebody else, it's not really what I want, because in that sense, I'm not acting for myself. It's what the other person wants. So I might choose something completely different, but if I'm acting for him, then I choose whatever he wants. And so Paul is saying, whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is not simply repeating the name. Some, some, some people think it's just a matter of all our prayers have to repeat the name Lord Jesus Christ and so on. And, and it's some sort of formula that we use. I heard of some Christians and everything they tried to do, every sentence they, they spoke, they ended it with, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, it just made a mockery of the whole thing, because that's not what Paul is speaking about at all. That just becomes uh, mindless uh, repetition, a vain repetition, empty repetition. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means that we do it consistent with his character. We do it as though he was doing it. And so um, N.T. Wright, who is a Bible teacher, says, Paul's exhortation is a salutary check on behavior. Can I really do this if I am representing the Lord Jesus? It's the idea of representing Christ. You see, the Lord Jesus, when he was leaving his disciples, he said to them uh, about doing things in his name because he was no longer going to be physically present. And so it is that we have the great privilege of representing the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul says, remember that. Whatever you do, particularly in the local church, whatever you do, make sure you do it in his name, with his authority, representing him, consistent with his character. And, of course, we end with giving thanks. And we, we mentioned already each principle we thought about is marked by thanksgiving. So in Christian relationships, we have got the three principles, the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, the word of Christ dwelling in our lives, and doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, consistent with his character. Let's move on briefly. I don't want to say too much about these uh, human relationships, but let's just turn to them now, because now Paul turns to things that are not really Christian, they're actually creatorial, or they're social in character. And he talks, first of all, about wives and husbands. And so he says in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, um, the Amplified Bible is quite helpful here. There's a footnote that says the wife is to submit voluntarily to her husband, not to men in general, not as inferior to him, nor in violation of her Christian ethics, but honouring her husband's responsibilities and authority as head of the household. Now, can you imagine in the 21st century anyone believing this? Well, we believe it. I believe this. And I believe that this is absolutely correct, that in the marriage relationship, that in the household, in the home relationship, God has ordered things in such a way that the husband is the head of the household and the wife uh, is uh, admonished here and encouraged to submit to her husband as it is fit, uh, the writer says, Paul says, in the Lord. So not to do things that are wrong uh, or, or sinful or anything like that, but as it is fit in the Lord. And then we turn to the husband. The husband's got a responsibility to love your wives. And the idea here, as you will know, this word love is the agape word, which means not just be affectionate towards your wife. Somebody might say, well, that's quite easy to love my wife. It means to love your wife in a sacrificial way as Christ loved the church. And uh, for those of us who are husbands, this is a, a, a very challenging word that our love for our wives ought to be the sacrificial type that is seeking always the well-being and blessing of its object. And so again, the Amplified Bible says like this, husbands love your wives with an affectionate, sympathetic, selfless love that always seeks the best for them and do not be embittered or resentful toward them 
because they've added here of the responsibilities of marriage. There are different views about this being bitter against them, but I think that the husband is always to have a sweet disposition. That's a good word for us, uh, we husbands, toward our wives. Let's, let's be marked. And, and you'll find that, I'm sure, uh, if a husband really is loving his wife and putting her interests first and being sacrificial on her behalf, and has a sweet disposition towards her, then there'll be no problem with the wife uh, voluntarily submitting to the leadership of the husband. That's in the wife and husband relationship. Then he moves on to children and parents. He says, children obey your parents in all things, but this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. It's interesting that only, I think I'm right in saying this, that only in the letters to the Ephesians and Colossians does the Bible specifically address children, or does Paul, sorry, I should say, specifically address Christian children? And so this is wonderful because these two letters are regarded as perhaps the most uh, rarefied air, the, the greatest doctrines, the, great, the highest theology that's unfolded in the New Testament that perhaps can be found in Ephesians and Colossians. And yet in these very complicated uh, incredibly deep passages, Paul turns to the Christian children who are listening to this being read out in the local church. This is how it happened in the early days. They wouldn't just take copies of this home. It would be read, and it would be read again, it would be read again, it would be read publicly, and the children in the audience are hearing this, and they're being told to be obedient to their parents. Now, listen to this. Obedience to parents is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Isn't that lovely? Here's something that young Christian children can do. They can uh, please the Lord. Uh, we, we think to please the Lord. Well, we do a lot to try and please the Lord. And what great thing could we do? Well, here it is for children to be obedient to their parents is pleasing, well-pleasing to the Lord. And again, the Amplified Bible I've quoted from here, it says, Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or exasperate your children with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by favoritism or indifference, treat them tenderly with loving kindness so they will not lose heart and become discouraged or unmotivated with the spirits broken. So that's a lovely word for parents and children. Then we move on to servants and masters. And servants, he says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not to men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong will receive for the wrong that he has done. There's no respect of persons. Then masters, give to your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Now you can see at a glance, that of all this uh, section dealing with human relationships, by a long way, most is addressed to the servants or the slaves. Look at that, one, two, three, four verses in our English Bible addressed to the servants. It has been estimated that perhaps the vast majority of early Christians uh, in Bible times would have been slaves. And so they are being addressed very specifically in a very detailed way here. And of course, some of the um, members of the local church would be masters. They would have servants as well. So this is dealing with servants and masters. We don't live in that situation today, but we can apply these principles to those who are employed and employers. So let's look at this just briefly. Uh, with regard to the servants, notice that obedience is commanded to obey your masters in all things. Obviously, there are limits to obedience uh, if we're asked to do something, whether it's in our work, uh, if we're asked to do something that is uh, uh, unethical, that is uh, dishonest, that is contrary to the word of God, then we have to make a stand. But then Paul goes on to say, not with eye service. In other words, not, not just when the boss is watching. Well, we can all identify with that, I'm sure. Suddenly, when the boss comes in, everyone's busy. Uh, well, that's not the Christian slave. This was a wonderful opportunity for testimony. Can you imagine a slave who's been converted and suddenly, overnight, his behavior changes altogether? He's obedient. He doesn't need to be told twice. And when the boss, when the master goes out of the room, he still works as hard as though uh, when he's still there. And with singleness of heart. In other words, 
with dedication, fearing God, and with the certainty of reward. If we go back to the passage there, you'll notice it says that uh, of the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Now, the interesting thing is that slaves couldn't have an inheritance. They never had an inheritance. They got nothing. They got their board, their food, and uh, a shelter, and that was it. Uh, but Paul says, listen, you may get nothing from men, but you'll get a reward of the inheritance from the Lord. And look at what he says at the end of verse 24. For you serve the Lord Christ. They might be saying, well, I don't. I serve uh, the man down the road, and he's a, he's a hard ta taskmaster. No, no, Paul says. And Paul's not talking about the preachers here. He's not talking about gospel preachers or, or people who teach the Bible. He's talking about household slaves. And he said, when you go about your normal tasks and you serve, you remember this, that you're serving the Lord. And that's something that applies to our um, workday lives as well. That as we serve our earthly masters, we do it with a higher motive. We're serving the Lord. And he says in verse 25 that there is a responsibility uh, that there'll be no respect of persons with God. Uh, there'll be reward. And of course, there'll be a lack of reward if we have not served properly. When we turn to masters, he says, give to them what is just and equal. Don't try to give them uh, the, 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 the least that you can get away with. And remember that you are accountable. You might be a boss, you might be a master, but remember you've got a master too. You've got a master in heaven and you're accountable to him. So these are wonderful human relationships. Finally, I've gone over the time, but just finally, we're going to turn now to world relationships. Um, it might be a bit of a stretch, this heading, but you'll see where I'm going, I think, as we go down the passage. Because Paul is widening out now. He's talked about the local church. He's talked about spiritual relationships. He's widened it out to human relationships and social relationships. And now he's thinking about our relationship with, as he, as he says here, uh, about those who are outside, outside of Christ. So he begins with mentioning prayer. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And specifically, he says, with all praying also for us, that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So Paul is saying, I want you to have a, a an outward looking prayer life that you're praying. I think Paul is really saying here, you're praying for the spread of the gospel. And specifically in my circumstances, I'm in prison at the moment, and perhaps that's where the Lord wants me to be, but perhaps it is that he can open a door of utterance, whether it's in the prison or whether it's by my release. So he's asking that the Christians pray that the gospel will progress, that the gospel will spread, that the mystery of Christ, the great doctrines that we've been thinking about, will be spread through the gospel. And so that's a first responsibility that we have. Our first duty to the world is in prayer. How much we need to pray for our nation, for our neighbours, for our friends, for our relatives, for those who rule over us. We're encouraged to pray and to pray for those who spread the gospel, to pray for the Pauls of our day who are involved on the front line, uh, down in the street, uh, in the open air, or with the children in the school, wherever. We need to pray, pray for those who are bringing the message of salvation to the lost. He mentions here continuing, he mentions watching, and he mentions being thankful. And of course, these are great principles we don't really have time to deal with tonight. He's uh, specifically mentioned his own ministry, but it's the idea of getting the message out to the world. Then he turns to a uh, walk. Uh, he says, walk and wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Uh, in other words, conduct yourself with wisdom in your interactions with outsiders, with non-Christians, making the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious. This is an encouraging uh, exhortation for us, to, to be wise in our conduct. When the Bible talks about a walk, of course, it's not how we walk down the street, it's our everyday life, it's in our interaction with people, when I meet them at the post office, when I meet them at the shop, uh, when I rub shoulders with them, when I'm with them at work, uh, when I see my neighbour walking in the, the dog or whatever, whatever it may be, we need to be marked by wisdom 
and we need to be careful how we behave in front of those who are outside of Christ, redeeming the time, looking for opportunities to perhaps introduce the subject of the gospel, uh, treating each moment as something precious. And this idea of redeeming the time has been expressed in different ways, buying back the moment, not spending it unworthily. It's really effective time management. And it's being, it's being intentional in our witness, not only walking before them, but looking for opportunities, perhaps to do good, perhaps to witness, uh, perhaps to drop a word uh, in the gospel. But Paul says, you need to exercise wisdom as you conduct yourself towards those who are not believers, redeeming the time. And then finally, he says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Grace and salt. Well, grace, uh, of course, is that gentleness and that kindness, uh, but salt as well is that which purifies, is that which speaks of cleanliness. It's something that gives a distinctive character. And so when... Christians talk, uh, just in a normal conversation, when they are talking to those outside. People should notice two things about our speech, and they're this, not how clever we are, or how witty, or how funny we are, but they should notice how gracious we are, that we don't complain, that we're not bitter, that we're not, that we're not murmurers, that we don't always have something to, to complain about, that we're gracious and kind and gentle in our speech, and yet we have that salt that we never allow our speech to become unholy or unclean. And there is something distinctive about how we talk about other people. That's what Paul is saying. It's very practical. And he says uh, you, that you might know how you ought to answer every man. Uh, in other words, he's saying not how you ought to preach to every man, but how you ought to answer them. He's assuming that if we live in such a way, if we're praying for people, if we're walking... And, and wisdom towards them. And if we are speaking with grace, uh, seasoned with salt, then we can assume that they're going to be asking questions. And Paul says, you must know how to be able to answer every man.